Next we look at Leonardo da Vinci. Now Leonardo is probably the best example we can possibly give of what a Renaissance person was all about, because Leonardo's interests were the things that the Renaissance was all about. Leonardo was interested in art, he was interested in science, he was interested in learning, and that is what the Renaissance was all about. So let's take a look at Leonardo da Vinci. He was born in 1452, and he died in 1519. He was from Italy, the nation that we today refer to as Italy. And it's interesting that the name da Vinci is not actually a name at all. In Italian, the phrase da Vinci means from Vinci. So Leonardo was actually named Leonardo, and he was from the town of Vinci. He was Leonardo from Vinci. Now, Leonardo was an artist, he was a scientist, he was the Renaissance man, the Renaissance person. Unquestionably, his most famous piece of art is this painting right here, which is known as the Mona Lisa. For the longest time, we did not know who this woman was. Uh, we have since discovered or figured out that her name was Lisa Girandini, and she was the wife of an Italian nobleman. And the story is that that um, the husband paid Leonardo to paint this picture, which Leonardo did, but he never actually gave the husband the painting. He just kept it for himself for whatever reason, kept the money too. We don't know if that's true, but that's, that's the story. Now again, this is by far the most famous painting that the world has ever seen. And a lot of students and a lot of people will ask, why? Why is this painting so famous? Well, there are a couple of things. First of all, look at her face. If you notice, there's a little bit of a smile there. Now to us in the 21st century, that doesn't really seem like a big deal. People smile all the time. You take your selfies and you take your pictures with your friends, your chums, your amigos, your BFFs, and you're always smiling and making you know, faces into the camera. So why is a smile a big deal? Well, today it isn't. But during the time of the Renaissance, very rarely were people smiling in paintings. And you'll notice if you look closely, there's some question as to whether she even is smiling. And a lot of people think that Leonardo put this little smirk on her face as a little joke, just to make us wonder, what is she smirking about? What is she thinking about? What is she smiling about? And of course the answer is, we'll never know. Another thing that's interesting about this painting, about this portrait, is the background. You'll notice that there is a landscape back there. There's a little road, there's a body of water, some trees and such in the background. And this is unusual too, because typically during this period, when someone would paint a portrait of somebody else, there was very little in the background because that was considered distracting. The focus of a portrait was the person being painted, not where they happened to be sitting. Well, Leonardo, completely changed all that by creating an interesting background as well as an interesting person. By the way, for those of you who are taking notes, that is the spelling of Mona Lisa. Now, after Leonardo's death, the Mona Lisa changed hands several times, and it eventually ended up in this museum right here. This is called the Louvre. It's located in Paris, France. The Louvre is full of artistic masterpieces and historical artifacts. The original Code of Hammurabi is in the Louvre. The, the Moabite Stone is in the Louvre. All kinds of other historical treasures. Yet, despite such a vast collection, the number one attraction in the Louvre, the main thing that people flock from around the world to see, the Mona Lisa. This is what it looks like when it's on display. As you can see, it's really not very large. It is protected behind glass, behind bulletproof glass. There have been people who have tried to vandalize it over the years, and so it is extremely well protected. Uh, I was there a number of years ago, and, you can, and I got my picture taken, but you can see there were several people behind me who were simply unwilling to get out of the way. I think they were just trying to achieve immortality by being on Mr. Gully's YouTube channel and by being featured, having their faces featured in Mr. Gully's class. But Mr. Gully has had the last word. Yes, they're in the picture, but their faces have been permanently blotched out. Hoo ha 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 ha. Revenge. Another famous piece of art by Leonardo da Vinci is this painting right here. This is called The Last Supper. 
Now, this is a good example of how oftentimes Renaissance artists were more interested in creating works of beauty than works that were historically accurate. Because as beautiful a painting as this is, there are some historical ina inaccuracies here. Now, let's, let's set the stage. Uh, this is supposed to represent the Last Supper, the final meal that Jesus Christ had the night before he was killed. And this painting is depicting, Leonardo says, the moment that Jesus Christ announces that one of his 12 apostles is going to betray him. And if you look at the apostles sitting on either side of him, they're all shocked. They're all astonished. They're all thinking, oh my goodness, it's it's not I, Lord, is it? That, that sort of attitude. And you can see in the middle, of course, Jesus is handling things very calmly. But again, we do mention that there are some historical inaccuracies. For example, this meal took place late at night. It was a supper. By definition, a supper takes place late at night. A dinner takes place in the mid-afternoon, early evening. A supper takes place late at night. And all accounts indicate that this meal did take place late at night. Yet, if you look out the windows behind Jesus, you'll notice that it is daylight. Makes for a good painting, but it's not historically accurate. There are a couple other little things in here. Um, notice this person right here. This appears to be a woman, not historically accurate. Jesus' apostles were all men. They were 12 Jewish men, and yet Leonardo seems to have painted a woman into the painting. Interesting. One other thing that some people have noticed is found right here. There is a floating hand among the apostles, and we don't know why that's there. Did Leonardo paint that there just to be amusing? Did he paint it there to make us wonder? Or is it an error on his part? He had intended to put an apostle there, a person there, and he painted the hand first, but never got around to it. We simply don't know. Nevertheless, The Last Supper is probably the second most famous painting ever to come out of the Renaissance. The only one that is more well-known than The Last Supper, of course, is the Mona Lisa. Now, interestingly, The Last Supper is not a traditional painting. It wasn't painted onto a canvas and then placed into a frame. No, The Last Supper is a fresco, which means it was painted directly onto the wall of a room. And it's in pretty poor shape these days. Uh, they have restored it to, to a considerable extent, and so they have, they have improved its condition, but it's still in pretty difficult shape. It will never probably be restored to the, to the full beauty that it had when it was originally painted. Nevertheless, though, The Last Supper does remain, and it remains as one of the greatest examples of Renaissance art. Another well-known example of a painting by Leonardo da Vinci is this one here. This one is entitled Lady with an Ermine. Now, it's pretty self-explanatory. This is the lady, and the animal that she's holding in her arms is an ermine. Now, this painting is a good example of the style that was used by Leonardo and by others as they painted people from the noble classes during the Renaissance. Another famous example of work by Leonardo da Vinci is this one right here. This is called Vitruvian Man. And we won't get into the scientific ideas or theories or principles behind it, but essentially Leonardo felt that what you see here represented the ideal proportions for a physically fit human being. You'll notice also, this is an example of Leonardo's actual handwriting, and you'll see that he wrote from right to left, not left to right the way the way we do. He wrote backwards, and the reason he did this is so that he would be able to disguise what it was he was writing. He didn't want other people to learn about his scientific discoveries and personal thoughts that he might have had or anything like that, and so he wrote backwards. The only way one can read his writing is by holding up a mirror to the paper and reading the reversed image on the mirror rather than reading the document itself. Very clever. Now, Leonardo also left behind a number of scientific notebooks. Now, the main purpose of these notebooks was quite simply to record his ideas for scientific discoveries and inventions that he wanted to put together and construct someday. Notice, by the way, his mirror handwriting here, writing from right to left. Now, many of Leonardo's proposed inventions, not all of them, but many of them had to do with warfare. Here's an example of a crossbow that he wanted to build. Now, this is a typical looking crossbow at first glance because we tend to think of a crossbow as having been a 
a, a weapon that was held by soldiers in their hands. And that's pretty much true. That's the way crossbows were used. However, look at the soldier here. Look at the size of him. He's an ordinary sized adult compared to the size of the crossbow. Massive weapon, something that Leonardo wanted to construct. He also invented what we today would call the tank. The tank that was used in warfare, that still is used in warfare. It looks different. It looks like a flying saucer or a spaceship or something, but it, is, it serves the purpose of being a armored vehicle. He called it a fighting machine that would have been virtually impenetrable by enemy soldiers, the tank. Leonardo invented a number of different other ideas. He invented what became known as the helicopter, at least the idea behind the helicopter. He invented the idea of contact lenses, any number of different ideas that, that he came up with. He didn't build very many or any of these inventions, but he did design quite a few of them. He also used his scientific notebooks to record his discoveries about the human body. He actually used to procure and dissect human cadavers, human bodies. And the reason he did this was because he wanted to learn as much as he possibly could about the proper functioning of the human body. How do the muscles work? How do the eyes work? How does the brain work? How do the various organs work? He wanted to know as much as he possibly could about the human body so that he could advance his own knowledge and also use that knowledge to produce more realistic pieces of art. We will conclude our look at Leonardo da Vinci with this picture right here. This is widely believed to have been a self-portrait that he did. And if it is a self-portrait, of course, this is what the man himself would have looked like. Toward the end of his life, Leonardo had moved from Italy into the nation of France, where he was living as a guest of the King of France. At the age of 67, Leonardo suffered a stroke and died not long after that. It is said that his last words were an apology to the people of the world and an apology to God. And what was he apologizing for? At the end of his days, Leonardo felt that he had not lived up to his own potential. He believed that his art was not as good as it could have been. His scientific discoveries were not as good as they should have been. Leonardo passed away believing that he had been a failure. But most people who have lived since and most people who have known about him since could not disagree with that more. Leonardo truly was the Renaissance man.